is Pamela Rutherford. I'm an associate press professor at Brandon University in Brandon, Manitoba, and I'm currently the president of CHS. And before we uh, uh, start on our program today, I want to pay my respects to the Dakota, Anishinaabek, Ojibwe, Cree, Dene, and Métis peoples who were the first keepers of the land where I currently live. So today we're joined by lots of people, meaning virtually, coast to coast to coast across Canada. And so I wanna acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis and First Nation peoples that call this land home. As herpetologists, our natural lands and the animals within them are extremely important to us. And so by recognizing indigenous peoples, it's a renewal of our commitment as a society to listen and cherish their traditional knowledge. I also wanna welcome any international participants we might have, our keynote speaker is joining us from across the border um, and the experience and the heritage that they bring with them. So greetings to everyone and your ancestors. Welcome, we're excited to have a full conference today. And I'm gonna have Amanda Bennett um, give a welcome in French. Merci, Pam. Bienvenue tout le monde. Uh, je m'appelle Amanda Bennett. Je suis associée de recherche au Conseil des Académies canadiennes et je suis secrétaire du Conseil d'administration de la SAH. Avant de commencer, j'aimerais reconnaître que puisque je suis à Oxford Mills, Ontario, je suis sur le territoire traditionnel non cédé de la nation Anishinaabe et Haudenosaunee. Aujourd'hui, nous nous rencontrons virtuellement partout au Canada et j'aimerais reconnaître le territoire traditionnel territoire et territoire non cédé de les Inuits, Métis et Premières Nations qui habitent cette terre. En tant qu'herpétologue, nos terres naturelles et les animaux qui s'y trouvent sont si importants pour nous. Cette reconnaissance est un renouvellement de l'engagement de notre société à écouter et à chérir le savoir traditionnel des peuples autochtones. Je souhaite également la bienvenue à tous les participants internationaux que nous avons aujourd'hui, ainsi que l'expérience et à l'héritage qu'ils apportent avec eux. Salut à tu ici aujourd'hui et à vos ancêtres aussi. Bienvenue. Okay, I'm going to now turn it over to Patrick Maldwin, who is going to introduce our keynote speaker today. Thank you, Pam, for the introduction and uh, and uh, merci Amanda as well for your introduction. Good morning, CHS members, friends, and colleagues in herpetology, and thank you for joining us. Uh, it's my pleasure and absolute honor today to introduce Dr. Katie Greenwald as our keynote speaker for our 2021 meeting. Uh, in a way that I think is relatable to many a naturalist and herpetologist, as a kid, Dr. Greenwald loved animals of all types and was always trying to sneak frogs and snakes into her house. She never really grew out of that zeal for the natural world, and as a young adult, she went on to earn her BSc degree in biology from Brown University. On entering graduate school, she set out to study how humans, uh, human landscape modification impacts wildlife, and she soon realized that both fortunately and unfortunately, uh, herps and salamanders specifically are a great system for this type of work because uh, they tend to have high site fidelity and limited dispersal as compared to a lot of other vertebrates. For a PhD at, on, at Ohio State University, Dr. Greenwald studied habitat fragmentation, functional landscape connectivity, and metapopulation processes in amphibians. It is perhaps no surprise that after a one-year postdoc, she began her professorship at Eastern Michigan University in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And I say no surprise here because Ypsilanti is home to herpetological lore. Um, if you haven't already heard, according to the urban legend, the smeat frog, which is both a furry and a flighted amphibian, is a mysterious resident of Ypsilanti. Uh, and I... And I uh, think that Dr. Greenwald will be happy to take some questions on that curiosity later. <laughs> so Dr. Greenwald and her students use molecular genetic tools to answer ecological questions, especially as these questions intersect conservation biology and herpetology. Not only does the research challenge our underlying assumptions about the fundamentals of biology, but they also inform the conservation challenges we face day to day. 
Dr. Greenwald's work takes place across the great state of Michigan, uh, locally in support of undergraduate research projects, but also further afield in places such as the islands of Lake Erie and the renowned E.S. George Reserve, home to uh, many a long-term herpetological study. The Greenwald Lab is currently working on projects investigating the stress response and dietary change to snakes in relation to urbanization, genetic and population studies of our beloved Ambistema, uh, the use of eDNA to map the distribution and population patterns of mud puppies, I would argue very badly needed work, so thank you for that, uh, and the use of museum specimens and genetic samples to trace a history of chytrid, especially as it relates to the decline of northern leopard frogs in eastern North America. When not in the field of the lab, Dr. Greenwald teaches herpetology, evolution, and conservation biology at Eastern Michigan University. And how's this for a twist of herpetological fate? But Dr. Greenwald's office, I noted, is located in the Jefferson Science Complex at Eastern Michigan University. Take that in, and Vistima nerds, the Jefferson Science Complex for somebody who studies in Vistima genetics. <laughs> All right, so Michigan is home to 52 herpetofaunal species compared to the 42 of its nearest neighboring province of Ontario. And it's noteworthy that 97% of Ontario's herps are also found in Michigan. And I'm also willing to wager that probably about 97% of the threats and challenges that uh, are faced by Ontario and Michigan herps are shared. And for that reason, uh, I think it's really important to remind ourselves that the exchange of information and collaboration between academics, government and non-government organizations and citizen or community scientists is crucial as we all work towards their like-minded goals to fill gaps uh, and, and conserve these animals that we hold so dear. So this, for among many other reasons, is why we're so fortunate to be joined uh, by Dr. Greenwald today. Uh, when we corresponded leading up to this conference, she said, and I quote, uh, my family thinks it's hilarious that my childhood's mischief basically became my full-time job. Um, and I think I speak on behalf of many young people in the audience today when I say uh, that we all hope and hold ambitions that such is the outcome for us too. <laughs> uh, I also asked Dr. Greenwald what motivates her research uh, and her continued interest in herpetological studies. And I think her answer was really telling of her selfless uh, nature. And, and what she gives back to the community. Well, her love for, an for animals is as strong as ever. Uh, and going out into the field, of course, is always lots of fun. Uh, she said, and I quote, the biggest motivator for me now is working with undergraduate and master's students. I've designed a research program at Eastern Michigan University with a specific goal of creating opportunities for student research. And it was an undergraduate experience is what led her to consider uh, graduate studies in academia as a career. And so providing these opportunities, especially for students from groups that have been historically excluded from ecology and conservation is really important." End quote. Uh, to me, Dr. Greenwald has always been a welcoming face at cross-border herpetological meetings. And although she may not know it, uh, she's been a longtime personal inspiration to me. Um, Dr. Greenwald also sits on the advisory board of the Michigan chapter of the Partners um, in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, and in doing so, gives back in so many ways. So today, uh, as to not take up any more of your time, uh, Dr. Greenwald will be sharing with us the topsy-turvy world of Ambistema, a topic that's sure to please given the, their curious biology, the number of talks that we're hosting this weekend that, uh, that deal with these curious critters, and the broad interest in molecular ecology and conservation biology at large among the Canadian herpetological community. So I encourage you to listen carefully because even when you think you understand the reproductive mode of these salamanders, uh, they almost always have something waiting just around the corner. So Dr. Greenwald, thank you so very much for joining us today. And I invite everyone to extend a very warm and virtual welcome uh, to Dr. Greenwald. With that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, I would like Patrick to just introduce every talk I give for the rest of my career. That was delightful and it's so much appreciated. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. Y'all can let me know if Things are looking uh, good on your end. Um, are you seeing the uh, the proper, just the? Yes, looks excellent. And not the presenter view problem that often happens on Zoom. Awesome. Well, thank 
Thank you again. Thank you all so much for, for the invitation today. Um, it is always a delight to get to talk about these totally crazy salamanders. Um, and uh, thanks for welcoming me as an honorary Canadian for the day. I'll be waving to you from across the river. Um, so, you know, as, as Patrick mentioned, I, I actually didn't start out working on actual Investima. I was actually warned away from them uh, when I started my graduate work at Ohio State. I was interested, as he mentioned, in how landscape impacts movement and population genetic structure in salamanders. And I initially planned to work with Jefferson salamanders. And Ralph Fingston, who probably many of you know, who we unfortunately lost this year, um, he, he said, no, mm, don't, not Jefferson salamanders. You will go and you will sample them and you will get them back to the lab and they won't be Jefferson salamanders. There'll be these weird hybrids. <laughs> um, and so I actually ended up working on marbled salamanders for much of my, uh, my grad work for that reason. But it always stuck in my head as something that was just this fascinating aspect of natural history in this part of the world. And uh, after seeing a talk by Jim Bogart late in my grad school career, I was just really hooked. And Jim, I don't know if Jim's on today, I was hoping to see his name on here, um, has just been an amazing mentor um, and, and guide as I have <laughs> delved into this world. So what I'd like to do today is, is just give kind of a general overview of why I think this is such a fascinating system, really from more of an evolutionary perspective. And just talk a little bit about some of the projects that we have um, we've pursued in my lab on these crazy beasts. So assuming that uh, it's maybe been a minute since some folks have had an evolution course or thought about um, the evolution of sex, I will open by just reminding you that sexual reproduction is actually somewhat of an evolutionary mystery. There are some pretty substantial disadvantages to sexual reproduction as well as some advantages. So I'll just briefly mention those as kind of framework. And then we'll talk about pond breeding salamanders in general. It's an audience of herpetologists. So I think most of you are probably pretty familiar with typical pond breeding ambistomatids and an overview of what the unisexuals do that is different and unique and totally weird. And like I said, then I'll kind of give you an overview, not in much detail, but of a number of projects that we've done with these sallies. So to start with, I mentioned, you know, that in terms of evolutionary biology, sexual reproduction is something of a mystery. And this has been an area of study for decades now, for, for longer than I've been alive, because there are a number of really important costs that were noted, um, primarily, you know, a famous work by John Maynard Smith back in the 1970s. And just to give a very brief overview of these, the first is that if you're going to reproduce sexually, you only get to put half your genes into the next generation, right? Whereas if you're an asexual reproducer, you get to pass along your entire genome intact to the next generation. So this is the cost of meiosis, the fact that you're going to lose half of your genetic information as you pass it along to the next generation when you're using sexual reproduction. There's also the cost of producing males. I always sort of joke when I teach evolution and apologize to the, <laughs> the males in the audience. Um, but the fact is that producing males creates a numerical disadvantage for sexually reproducing lineages. If you imagine a female that can produce two offspring, if she's asexual, those can both be female. And then each of those female offspring can produce two more female offspring and so on and so forth. Whereas in a sexual lineage, half of those offspring will be male. And so only 50% will directly reproduce and, and add to kind of the numbers of the next generation. So what this means is that over the course of time, what you would expect is that an asexual lineage would grow twice as fast as a sexual lineage would. And then last but not least, there's a cost involved in actually finding someone to mate with. So courtship and mating have costs of time and energy, um, territorial defense in species that do that, avoiding predation during those times of interacting for mating and so on. So why then do we have 
sexual reproduction being really the dominant mode of reproduction among vertebrates. Why is it so prevalent? And it is, it's, you know, the vast majority of vertebrates reproduce sexually. And in fact, asexual vertebrate lineages tend to be relatively short-lived on an evolutionary time scale. So they will crop up typically being derived from sexually reproducing taxa, and then they won't last all that long in the grand scheme of things, evolutionarily speaking. So it's quite prevalent. There must be some benefits of sexual reproduction. And there are several, again, that I will mention. I'm happy to answer questions about these. If you all have questions while I'm talking, please feel free to put them in the chat and I will try to keep an eye on that as well. Um, but the major benefits of sexual reproduction primarily have to do with bad mutations that might crop up. And a famous uh, phrasing of this is, is the so-called Muller's ratchet, the fact that if a crummy mutation crops up in a line, an asexual lineage has no way to get rid of it, right? Because like I said, that entire genome is passed down intact. And so then if another crummy mutation pops up, subsequent generations will have both of those and you'll have these potentially deleterious mutations ratcheting up in these asexual lineages. Whereas in sexual taxa, every generation you have a 50-50 shot of getting rid of those crummy mutations. Similarly, you have cases where combinations of mutations might be worse than either one would be alone. So you can think of these as just bad combinations of genes that you wouldn't want to be kind of locked in in tandem going forward indefinitely in an asexual population. Sex can break up these bad combinations. And last but not least, and an idea that really intrigues me in terms of thinking about the unisexual taxa um, or salamanders is the so-called red queen hypothesis, which posits that sexual reproduction will be especially adaptive in situations where you have high loads of natural enemies like parasites and pathogens. Um, or other things that really rapidly change the selective environment of the organisms. Because what you can have are, first of all, just kind of shuffling the cards every generation. So you have a whole bunch of extra varieties of uh, uh, genotypes that are produced by sexual reproduction. There's a better chance that some of those, or even one of those, may be resistant, right? And that that one can then be selected for. But if that selective landscape changes, you still have the possibility of putting back together perhaps old combinations of genes that might have been uh, more adaptive in other selective landscapes. So you can really think about this as you know, sexual reproduction being adaptive in situations where you expect selective pressures to vary over time. That's the end of my evolution lecture for you today. And now we're gonna talk about salamanders. So, the reason that uh, these, these guys are so fascinating, I mean, there are lots of just kind of general life history um, reasons that they're fascinating that we'll get into. But as you kind of keep these big evolutionary questions in mind, or I'll, I guess I'll ask you to keep them in mind as we talk about how these critters actually reproduce. So what are they doing? Why am I telling you about sexual and asexual reproduction? Well, we'll see in just a minute. Like I said, I'll start out just briefly mentioning breeding in typical pond breeding salamanders, which uh, I think this audience is probably quite familiar with already. Um, here in, in Michigan and the work I've done in Ohio, you know, these uh, critters are typically breeding in uh, vernal pool habitat, temporary or ephemeral wetlands. These can be, you know, floodplain, um, a lot of kettle hole wetlands in the part of the world that I'm in now. And we are typically seeing adult breeding migrations in mid to late March in this part of the world. And so of course they're uh, moving to these wetlands to reproduce where uh, courtship and egg laying happens and the larvae spend some time developing, undergo a metamorphosis and then live out the rest of their days as terrestrial adults. So this is the life cycle of our typical, you know, sexually reproducing pond breeders. And when I am talking about uh, the sexual species that are involved in the story today, it's primarily these five. So um, these are all, as I mentioned, sexual reproducers, meaning they have males, they have females, 
they have two sets of chromosomes, just like all of us. And when they reproduce, the offspring are um, include one set of chromosomes from mom and one set of chromosomes from dad. So all of these are good, quote unquote, normal, <laughs> normal species. Um, and so what I'll do is just call your attention to the abbreviations on these slides. So we have Ambistoma laterale, the blue spotted salamander, and I've got a little L in parentheses next to that species. And that's because we're going to start talking about genes that are coming, or genomes rather, that are coming from these species. So there will not be a quiz, and I will try to remind you what species is what abbreviation, but I wanted to point that out on this slide. So uh, here in Michigan, and probably where many of you all are, um, if, you, if you have unisexual salamanders or you have uh, ambistomatid salamanders, we're primarily in the range of the blue spotted salamander. So those are our most abundant um, sexual taxa that are involved in the complex. For me, you know, we also have tiger salamanders. Uh, we have a couple of maybe populations of smallmouth salamanders in Michigan, but we're right at the northern edge of their range here. And you have to go a bit south um, for us to really get south and east to find good populations of Jefferson salamanders. There are lots of those like in northeast Ohio um, and south from there. And the streamside salamander has a much more restricted range, which is down in southern southwest Ohio and uh, northwest Indiana and parts of Kentucky. So that one is distributed uh, quite far south of where I am. But you'll see why it's important here in just a minute. So folks that have done work in um, in wetlands with, with these species within the range of the unisexuals have probably come across critters that look a, like a little bit of a mishmash. So they look like hybrids, right? But I'm going to uh, harp on, probably hopefully not too much, the fact that these are not hybrids. So none of these sexual species that I'm showing you here can breed, can interbreed with one another. So we do not find F1 hybrids of any of these taxa. That's what was thought to be going on for a long time. So I always like to be clear that that's not what's going on. What's going on is actually way cooler than that. So none of these sexual taxa are currently interbreeding. And yet we find critters that look like this. This is an animal from Kelly's Island, Ohio and Lake Erie that is about the size of a tiger salamander, but it is clearly not a tiger salamander. It's got some blue spots on it. And it's also, I don't know how well you can see it in this shot, but it's got some head morphology that looks a little bit like a smallmouth or a streamside salamander. It's got that really kind of crunched, I always say they look like they ran into a wall at high speed. Um, so you see these animals out when you're in the field and they look like a mishmash of one or more, you know, two or more of these sexually reproducing species. So what the heck is she? Well, this is my favorite. This is my favorite unisexual. Uh, the Kelly's Island critter. And when we take a tissue sample and take it back to the lab, what we find is that she's actually a triploid. So she has three complete sets of chromosomes. One of those is from the blue spotted salamander that was in the stimulaterale, the L. One is from Texanum, the smallmouth salamander. And one is from Tigranum, the tiger salamander. And so she is what we call an LT tiger, a triploid, again, with three complete sets of chromosomes from uh, those three sexual species. As if that wasn't already really weird, <laughs> weird enough, that's just her nuclear DNA. If we look at the mitochondrial DNA of these salamanders, what we find is that they're much more similar to Ambistoma barbari, the streamside salamander, the one I mentioned with the really restricted range. It's still quite different, um, but of all of the, the, the ambist related ambistomatids, it's the closest to, to Barbari or the streamside salamander. So this is an animal with basically four different species genomes in its cells, and this is somehow producing a functional animal. So what the heck is going on here? Um, <laughs> this is a mode of reproduction that Jim Bogart and colleagues have termed kleptogenesis, right? Or they're our little gene thieves. They are all female or virtually all female. 
and they are typically polyploid. We do sometimes get diploid ones, 2N animals, um, and they range all the way up through pentaploid. The pentaploids don't tend to do very well. So when we're looking at populations of adults in the wild, uh, the tetraploids are about as high as you see at the adult stage. We do find pentaploids as larvae, but they don't, they don't tend to make it, at least at our sites. So how are they doing this? Well, they're breeding in those same wetlands that I showed you the picture of with the sexual species at the same time with one or more of those sexual taxa that are breeding in the early spring. And those are the, the species that I showed you the pictures of. And these unisexual females are picking up spermatophores from whatever males are there in the pond. So the males of these other sexually reproducing species. Then they have some options. <laughs> the first option is that, and this appears to be the most common, at least at our sites from the, the egg clutches we've genotyped, is that they are really apparently just using that spermatophore to trigger the development of the eggs. However, the male's genome doesn't actually make it into the resultant offspring. So this is fundamentally an asexual process, right, known as gynogenesis. So they do need the males around to trigger egg development, but then the male's genome, the paternal genome is not incorporated into the offspring. So if that's what they were doing, that would be gynogenesis, and that would be something that's known from other, other species, uh, primarily a number of fish taxa. But they're even weirder because sometimes the male genome does make it into the resultant offspring. And most commonly when this happens, it happens via what we call ploidy elevation, meaning that it's just stuck in there extra. So if mom was a diploid with two sets of chromosomes, she'd then produce offspring with three sets of chromosomes or ploidy elevated offspring that have both of hers and the father's. Rarely, there have been instances of genome replacement documented where the eggs that are produced are missing one of the maternal genomes, but then the paternal genome is included. So this appears to be quite a rare phenomenon, but it is something that's been shown um, a handful of times. And then last but not least, just to make sure that I get a really bad headache when I'm in the lab, the last option is more than one of the above. So uh, you know, at our you know, field sites, these animals are often laying something like 80-ish eggs in a clutch, and those eggs can be a mix of these things. So we very frequently genotype clutches and find that, for example, two thirds of the eggs are gynogenetically produced and a third of them are ploidy elevated and do include the paternal genome. I often joke that starting to work on these salamanders in Ohio was either the best or the worst place in the world to do it. Because as you can see on the map here, Ohio is where we have overlap of just about all of the potential sperm donor or the sexual re sexually reproducing species that contribute genomes to this complex. So um, in my, one of my first projects was to actually try to design an assay, a genetic assay, to figure out what genomes are even in there in Ohio, because there are so many possibilities for uh, what genome combinations <laughs> might be present. This is a sort of a general outline of the range of the unisexual salamanders. So they really are just kind of distributed around the Great Lakes and up into the Northeastern US and, and Southeastern Canada. Um, there are, uh, there's a lot of variation, though, within this range, as I'll get into, in terms of the density, you know, the, the frequency of these animals within populations. There are certain pockets, and I'm sitting in one of them right now, where they are just ridiculously abundant. So 90 to 95 percent of a lot of the sites around here with pond breeding salamanders will be unisexuals. So depending on where, uh, where you are in the range and what sexual species are breeding in the wetlands in that area, these gals will be picking up different genomes, right, and, and creating different combinations, so-called biotypes or genomotypes. And they are most commonly triploid. Uh, that seems to be a general rule across the board. So at our sites, we have very high frequencies of 
LLJ triploids because we have blue spotted salamanders. And so we mostly get L's from them from the laterality. But if you move into, um, you know, even across the border down into Ohio, you start getting into the range of Texanum and they start getting more T's. You see more of the LTT type. Um, and, you know, further south and east from there, you get more Jefferson's influence. So at this point, I think there have been 26 different genome combinations identified across the range because remember that they vary in ploidy. So at our sites with mostly blue spotted, we still have LJ diploids, LLJ triploids, LLLJ tetraploids, and the very occasional LLLJ pentaploids. So at this point in the talk, oh, and one thing I didn't mention, I mentioned, I, I got on my soapbox about how they are not hybrids, the lineage did likely start with a hybridization gone awry, um, but data uh, by Jim Bover and, and colleagues suggest that that was probably five or six million years ago. So this is, as far as we know, the oldest unisexual lineage that there is of vertebrates. So they're really cool um, and they're doing this really unique thing. And if you think back to the introduction, uh, you know, there are ways you can kind of imagine that this might be what I, I like to term an evolutionary win-win, right? That they are avoiding some of those fundamental costs of sexual reproduction, but also reaping some of the benefits because they can incorporate novel genetics, increase the variation of the population and so on. So oftentimes when I'm talking about the unisexuals, at this point, I pause for questions, even though we're only in the middle of the talk, because these things are crazy. And I wanna make sure that I'm not missing any questions on just kind of the basics of the reproductive mode before we get into the type of research that's going on in my lab. So I'm gonna take a peek at the chat. Is the chat, are there any, any no, uh, no frantic questions about what the heck you are talking about, lady, this is crazy. Oh, there's a lot of, how are you all getting frog and lizard stickers? This is good. I need to learn how to do this. <laughs> there is a question there at the bottom from Barb. Do you see a difference in red blood cell size between the diploids and the triploids? Yes, absolutely. Yep. And a lot of the early papers um, used flow cytometry to differentiate between, uh, between the ploidy levels. You know, the tricky thing with this is that you do get diploid unisexuals in some populations. So if you had, for example, LJ diploids coexisting with typical blue spotted LL, <laughs> regular sexual species, um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to tell. So that it really is differentiates ploidy, but not biotype. Yep. Any work on how females choose a specific spermatophore to pick up? We will get to that. Yes, <laughs> that is a great segue. Um, yes, that is, that's a, the big question, I think. Um, you mentioned the five sexuals, don't produce F1s. What about in the lab? Um, that is an awesome question. Can they be crossed? You know, I think that they have been at least maybe blue spotted and Jefferson's have been crossed in captive conditions. Um, you can do certain things uh, with, with modifying temperature and so on. Um, you know, IVF like <laughs> possibilities with salamanders. So I don't know about any potential, uh, any attempted crosses though beyond the, the blue spotted and the Jeffersons, which are, uh, are the most common genomes that you see in the unisexuals. I didn't mention, um, I meant to mention on this, this slide we're on now, but you know, so far, as far as we can tell, the only rules for the unisexuals are that they all have at least one L. So everybody's got some blue spotted, even the ones that are far south of the range of blue spotted salamanders, they've still retained that blue spotted, at least one blue spotted genome. And the other rule appears to be that they have something else. So we've never found one that's like LLL with nothing else. There's always some other genome present um, and always at least one L. So that was a bit of a tangent, but yeah, Julie, that is, that's a good question. How do you even start to make a phylogeny in here for these? You don't, well, you do, you can do it very easily with mitochondrial DNA. So, Thank goodness for mitochondrial DNA, right? It is maternally inherited and these are all female. And so if you make a phylogeny based on mitochondrial DNA, you have a beautiful picture 
of exactly where they fall out. And that's how we know they're most closely related to Barbari. So Barbari was probably the maternal ancestor of this, this group. Um, but the nuclear DNA, you can't, right? Because they are just, they are swapping that in and out on an ecological time scale, really. And so, um, yeah, so it's something, you know, I've struggled with because I have this interest in population genetics. Um, but with these salamanders, you can't really do it because if you show gene flow, you can't know if that gene, if those alleles were moved by unisexuals or if those alleles were moved by blue spotted and then stolen by unisexuals in their new location. So yeah, that's, uh, they're tricky for sure. All right, so I'm missing a lot of messages. Okay, have there been any experimental attempts to use species from outside the unisexual's natural range as sperm donors? Oh, with well, Mexicanum, that would be that would be very interesting. The only one I'm I'm aware of is actually not from outside the range, but it's maculatum. So there may be folks wondering what what's going on. Maculatum is in these same ponds at the same time. Um, but we don't find M's. So I mean, I never say never. These are so weird that maybe we will, but so far um, they do not appear to be genetically complementary, whatever that means. Um, again, I do think that Jim Bogart has actually gotten them to, he's, he's had success in the lab using maculatum spermatophores to trigger egg development, um, but it doesn't appear to happen in nature. So so that's uh, it's a good question. Mexicanum, no one's tried that one, um, but it, it would be possible if you could try it. Um, how do you determine which are hybrid and which are diploid unisexual? Um, so we typically, when we're working in areas like Ohio with all these possibilities, we would start with, uh, with just genotyping uh, mitochondrial locus. So we would, that would let us parse out, okay, these are all unisexuals and these are all whatever sexual species they are. And then we could take that pool of unisexuals and do a second um, screen and those we either, depending on what genomes are going to be involved, uh, we can use microsatellites here in Michigan because we only have L's and J's. So we have loci that we know are, are discrete. Um, down in Ohio, I developed an assay with SNPs so that we could look at what genomes were in there. So yeah, we have, we have a kind of a, a two-step process for, for that. So those were great questions. Cool. I think I hit the the end of the chat question. So um, like I said, the rest of the talk then, I'm just gonna give you kind of an overview of some of the projects um, that we've got going on in the lab. And my slides are not wanting to advance anymore. There we go. Um, and they really all focus on this fundamental question of, is this a win-win, right? What are the costs and benefits of this really cool and unique mode of reproduction. We know from the literature that although, you know, I just talked up this, how cool this is and how, how great unisexuals are, they're actually bad at a lot of things. <laughs> so when I first made this slide, I, that's how I titled it, unisexuals are bad at a lot of things, but then I decided to make it a little more specific. So we know from some older work that in general, uh, unisexual females are discriminated against by the sexual males. So sexual uh, males of both Jeffersons and blue spotteds have been shown to prefer to breed with, with females of their own species, which makes sense because those females have to include some of their DNA in the next generation. So that's a potential disadvantage. They also have very high um, egg mortality, although this, uh, it appears to vary quite a bit from, from site to site. So there's some potential for geographic variability actually in both of these. Um, but they do, you know, ponds where we have a lot of unisexual salamanders, we see a lot of eggs that are not developing that are, as you can see in the bottom, um, this is a, a paper by Noah Charney and colleagues. Um, and that panel B, you can see those white eggs that are, they've just gone bad, right? They're, they're not developing and they've been overtaken by um, by fungus. So we, and we tend to see actually whole clutches, lots and lots of unisexual eggs that will just um, fail to develop and eventually get all icky. And then you can't genotype them either. So that's a bummer. <laughs> and from what we've done uh, with some work raising them up in the lab, 
we see a much higher frequency of developmental anomalies as well. So you can see the top pictures are normally developing eggs and early um, larvae, and the bottom pictures are unisexuals um, that have some extra gastrulation, I think. I am not a developmental biologist, but I have one in my department who helped me. Um, and then they, a lot of just issues with, um, with development of the, the spinal column and curvature of the body and so on that happened when we were looking at these critters in the lab. So some substantial disadvantages in terms of, um, you know, their actual reproductive events. And then they're also at a disadvantage when it comes to moving around on the landscape. So I think I have time to do this. So I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna do a different share um, because for this study, my colleague Rob Denton, who's shown at the bottom and I, uh, we actually did put salamanders on treadmills and you can't say you put salamanders on treadmills without showing salamanders on treadmills. So. Are you all seeing the video now? Good, okay. So here's a treadmill. Oops, I don't need to see it again. All right. Let me get back to my slideshow here. Um, so that was really cute also. But the point, of, <laughs> the point of that study was that we were interested in looking at um, potential limitations to their physiology because, as you, some of you may know, a lot of metabolic proteins um, include components that are that are coming from mitochondrial DNA and other components that are coming from nuclear DNA. And so when you have this mismatch of this, I mean, they're different species, right? We hypothesize that that might create some issues for uh, the physio, you know, the, the actual sort of physiology of these organisms. And, and that's indeed exactly what we found. So the unisexuals, um, they just, they couldn't go as far. So in the trials, they would eventually just kind of fall off the back of the treadmill and be done. Uh, Texanum traveled about four and a half times farther than the unisexuals did. And we didn't have great sample sizes for the other species, but they were, the other sexual species were about right in line with Texanum as far as their ability to, um, to continue walking on that treadmill. And the neat thing about this paper is that Rob then extended it to the natural environment and did a bunch of uh, work looking at population genetics and connectivity of the landscape and, and showed that, yeah, we do actually see, um, we see less, less connectivity, more restricted movement for the unisexual. So it did sort of translate to, um, to what we're seeing on the ground. And this was a, another study out of Ohio. So I told you they're not very good at reproduction. They're not very good at dispersal. Um, what are they good at? Well, again, they're good at making females. So we've, we've got that, that checkbox. Um, and they appear to be good at making use of potentially more kind of marginal habitat in some cases. So this was a study out of my postdoc in Ohio where I ran all over the place and got samples and looked at um, what proportion of populations were sexual taxa versus unisexuals. And then we did some environmental niche modeling to look at um, whether, whether there were differences, right? So are the unisexuals as a whole using kind of a different environmental niche than the sexual taxa? And then were the ones, were the uh, genotypes, the um, biotypes different from their most closely associated sexual species? So were LJJs different from Jefferson's? And were LLJs different from blue spotted's? And were LTTs different from Texanum? Or is being an LTT basically the same thing as being a Texanum in terms of what type of environment you're living in? So again, I ran all over. Uh, this was the SNP analysis that I mentioned I developed to look at what genomes were in there. Happy to talk about those methods and folks that are interested, but it's pretty hairy. <laughs> <laughs> Worked okay though. Um, and what we eventually found was that, so the unisexuals as a whole were actually quite different from any of the uh, associated sexual taxa. 
And when we compared um, LJJs and Jefferson's, what we found was that the LJJs tended to be in areas that had been more modified by human land use. So they were in areas that were more agricultural, um, more residential development, just sort of more impacted, while the Jeffersons were in areas that were um, more, more pristine, right, that hadn't had those types of landscape impacts. So this was cool because this was what we had hypothesized would be the case in that the unisexuals might be using these sort of marginal habitats. Unfortunately, though, as often happens in science, when we looked at the LTTs and Texanum, we found exactly the opposite. We found that the LTTs tended to be in the less modified uh, landscapes and the Texanum tended to be in the areas that were uh, primarily for them mostly impacted by agriculture. So this is a, a bit of a head scratcher. You know, what does it mean? Um, Fundamentally, they're just different. You know, it was interesting in that they're not completely the same as their uh, most closely related uh, sexual taxa. Um, it may be that Jefferson salamanders are out competing the LJJs in those kind of more pristine areas, um, or it could be that this is an advantage to the unisexuals, right? And that those LJJs are just somehow more robust or more resistant to this type of landscape change and better able to make use of that kind of more marginal habitat. But like I said, the relationship was exactly the opposite for Texanum and LTTs. So again, kind of summary here was that the unisexuals do use different ecological space from those sexual species and from each other. And so in a lot of cases, we kind of lump them together as this, this big weird, weird group, um, but they are actually uh, somewhat different from one another in terms of the types of places that we're finding them on the landscape. Another question we've looked at is why so many of them are triploid. So I mentioned in this part of the world, um, they are hugely abundant. So at the sites at the George Reserve where I work, typically more than 90% of, of the palm breeding salamanders will be unisexuals. And of those unisexual salamanders, about 90% will be triploid LLJs. And the remainder are mostly tetraploids, LLLJs. So these are data generated by my graduate student, uh, my very first graduate student, actually Christina Castro, who's shown in the picture here. And we worked at the George Reserve with um, drift fenced ponds. This is when we get there too early. <laughs> this is what they look like. When we get there at the right time, though, there are crazy numbers of salamanders piling into the pitfall traps around these drift fences. This is me feeding one to my infant. No, I was, <laughs> it's just the angle of the photo. I was not feeding her a salamander, um, but we did have field season with a, you know, a two month old. So that was exciting a number of years ago now. Um, my more typical field assistants are uh, EMU students like Katie Schott shown here. So we've done a lot of work at this site. Um, we've attempted a big mark recapture project, uh, which has been a very difficult thing. Um, but what Christina was looking at was these frequencies of, um, of biotypes at these sites. And we knew from earlier work by Jim Bogart that there appears to be an association of temperature with the likelihood of genome addition. So in the lab, he had shown that at warmer temperatures, you're more likely to have those paternal genomes get added into the offspring. What was really neat in Christina's work is that she showed the same thing. So both of these graphs are showing you the percentage of a sample that is tetraploid over time. And so you have, she sampled the breeding adults, early larvae just post hatching, later larvae kind of just pre-metamorphosis, and then metamorphs leaving the ponds. And this was a year, um, 2012, I can't believe it's been that long ago, where we had a really abnormally warm spring, right? I say abnormally, although we all know it's getting more and more normal, but it was very warm. Um, and so what she saw was that in this very, very warm spring, those early larvae came out with very high frequency of tetraploids, so much higher than what the breeding adult population had been. But over time, those tetraploids disappeared. And by the time we got to metamorphs leaving the pond, we were back down to the same kind of 10% plus or minus um, tetraploid is what we typically see in the adult population. So this was really interesting because it showed that temperature can be important in wild populations as well, 
but also that there's some sort of selective disadvantage to the tetraploids across that larval period. They just weren't surviving as well as the triploids were. In a more normal year, the following year, she went out and resampled, and we did not see that bump in terms of the percentage of tetraploids at this site. So um, when we have our, our more typical, his, more historically typical cool spring temperatures for, for breeding season, um, then there was no difference across any of the life stages in terms of the frequency of tetraploids. So last but not least, I'll, I'll mention um, just kind of this big question, what else affects genome addition? This was a question from the chat. I think this is the big question and I'm not alone, right? This is a great cartoon that Jim Bogart drew that I put in every talk and it might embarrass him, but I love it. Um, where the salamander's going up to the help desk and it's got waste genomes there. It can throw one out that it doesn't like anymore. You know, maybe it can order one up that's better for cold temperatures or better for dispersal or so on. So you can imagine lots of ways that these species differ from one another and that having some of their genetic information might potentially be adaptive. So we've tried to address this question in a couple of ways. Um, we've tried to set up breeding trials where we put unisexual salamanders in with different types of males. And then we genotype mom and dad and the clutches and see if that paternal genome gets added. So these are a couple of my very early undergraduate researchers doing this work at the George Reserve. Um, this didn't work because when we went back in the morning, we had extra salamanders inside the boxes, <laughs> which was not what we thought would happen. So we switched our method and started just using these little plastic shoe boxes for our kind of our, our breeding trials. We would put some leaf litter in there and some water from the ponds, and we would put salamanders. In this experiment, we were using um, unisexual salamanders and putting them in either with a male blue spotted from their same pond or a male blue spotted from a pond that was far away. And lo and behold, it worked. They will actually lay eggs in these little boxes and then we can let, let the adults go and genotype the eggs. And they won't again get delve too much into the methods but we typically just use a panel of microsatellite loci for this. So we can see that in this case, you've got Dad's a diploid, he's got two big peaks, right? He's a regular blue spotted salamander, so he ought to be a diploid. Mom is a triploid, she has three peaks at this locus. And then what we're able to do is see if the offspring that are produced just have the same alleles as mom and they're gynogenetically produced offspring, or do they have a paternal allele that appears like this one does where you can see it has four peaks, all of moms plus one of dad's. What we saw in this experiment was quite interesting, um, which was that, you know, I didn't actually expect anything to come of this. It was really just, we were trying it to see if it would work, but the females that were with males from a faraway pond actually produced fewer clutches overall. So they were less likely to, um, to even reproduce. And then of those clutches that they produced, a lot of them failed to genotype. And so I think this happens when they fail to pick up a spermatophore, right? So they'll still lay those eggs, but the eggs will not develop. And so we had about 22% um, uh, that we were able to, um, to genotype from uh, male-female pairs from different ponds versus 53% if they were from the same pond. But even more crazy, those within pond or same pond pairs had a higher frequency of genome addition. So if they were both parents were from the same pond, about 60% of those offspring were ploidy elevated offspring that included the paternal genome. Whereas if they were from different ponds, it was much lower. It was like 12% on average. So this is, I'm still wrapping my head around this result. <laughs> I'm not sure whether this is what I would expect or not. I'd love folks' thoughts afterwards. Um, it's very interesting though, because right, producing those tetraploids as we saw in Christina's work, isn't necessarily adaptive, right? There's, some, there's selection against them during that larval period, or at least there was during the year that we tracked that. So is this a pro or a con? I'm actually still not sure. Our current work in the last study that I will mention is the work of a graduate student who just finished up in my lab, Kelsey Mitchell, who's shown here. And she was interested in looking at 
the question of whether they've always been this abundant or whether um, there has the, that the sort of frequency, the relative frequency of unisexuals has changed over time. And this is really harkening back to uh, an old hypothesis, a paper by Clanton from 1934, where he advanced to the idea that there might be this sort of predator prey model sort of thing happening with these critters, where the unisexuals, because they're all female and they can balloon their populations relatively quickly, they might become very abundant. But at that point, they do still require those males to be around for them to reproduce. And so if there are too many of them, that they might actually sort of wipe themselves out, right? Because there wouldn't be enough males to go around until the sexual species population could build itself back up to a reasonable level. And then the unisexuals could follow and build their, their own population back up. And so there might be this sort of cyclical fluctuation in terms of the relative abundance of these taxa. So Kelsey was interested in this, and she was also interested in whether, um, whether we could see any patterns in light of climate change. So we know that, that the you know, average temperatures and, and phenology and so on are changing at the George Reserve. And so she was curious to see whether we could relate that um, frequency of unisexuals to any of those climatic metrics as well. So fortunately for us, the George Reserve has this very long history of of herpetological work. And there's a great collection from there at the University of Michigan's Museum of Zoology. <coughs> so what Kelsey was able to do was actually use museum specimens. And this goes back to the question about red blood cells. She used epidermal um, cells and looked at the size of the nuclei to assess ploidy in those older historical specimens. She called them historical, but they're from the 90s, so I don't feel comfortable calling them historical, but we'll just <laughs> stick with what she said. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, we couldn't genotype them. They were all formal and fixed, and so we did have to use, uh, just be able, we could just assess ploidy in the older, you know, high school era um, samples, and then we were obviously genotyping the ones that we are currently working with. So I'm hoping we can beef up her sample sizes a bit in the next year or so. It was really tricky to get the data, particularly from the older specimens. But what was really neat is that she had six ponds at which we could get some numbers at least from the early samples to work. And we had some good sampling in more recent years. And for five out of those six ponds, what we saw was a decline in the proportion of the population that is full blue spotted salamander. So that's what the y-axis is here, proportion a laterally. So in general, for the early sampling that she looked at, she would find, you know, 60, 80% of the population would be diploid based on those um, assays from the, the historical or the, the preserved specimens. Whereas, as I mentioned, now when we go out there and we sample, what we're finding is, is usually 90 plus percent are unisexual salamanders. So this was a statistically significant pattern across the board of a uh, decline in the, the frequency of blue spotteds. Um, we can't really parse out whether this is the Clanton effect that I mentioned or something to do with climate change um, because they both kind of make the same prediction here. You know, we are right, the George Reserve is right at the southern edge of the range of laterally. And so we predict in light of climate change that we see de potentially, de potentially we would see decreases in, um, in laterally if, they, if their range is sort of constricting northward as the temperatures increase. So um, just to kind of sum it all up, I know that was a lot, a big overview of a lot of studies with not a lot of detail, but I wanted to just address how cool this system is um, and how I think it's really a neat system for looking at this really important evolutionary question about sexual reproduction. Why is it so common? What are the costs and the benefits? These are critters that can kind of decide right, um, to, to reproduce either way. And so looking at this really highly successful, uh, very old lineage as far as unisexual lineages are concerned is I think a really neat way to start thinking about these evolutionary questions. So we're interested in, in the adaptive advantages of this mode of reproduction. Why are there so many unisexual salamanders here in Southeast Michigan? 
as I told you, there are disadvantages. So they have reproductive disadvantages. They're pretty crummy dispersers relative to the sexual taxa. There are potentially ecological benefits. They are making use in some cases of some fairly marginal habitats that the sexual species don't seem to prefer as much or are excluded from for some reason. Um, and then the big question, right, is what's going on with, with this, I said decision in quotes, with you know, whether or not they reproduce sexually. So whether that paternal genome makes it into the offspring. We know temperature is important, um, but it does seem like there may be other things going on. And so I think that's really kind of one of the most exciting areas of future research is trying to parse out when they're reproducing, which way. Um, does it vary with uh, across time or with climate? I'd love to design some sort of test of the Red Queen if we had populations where we could, um, you know, impose or make them perceive some sort of high load of parasites or pathogens. If there are any disease ecologists out there that have ideas about this, let me know. I think it would be a really cool way um, to test that hypothesis. So I will uh, close by just thanking a number of folks that have helped. I mean, I've presented a lot of results. So I had a lot of help from students, particularly, um, you know, a lot of colleagues that helped with the collection of all those samples down in Ohio. And then at this point now, 10 years of students at Eastern Michigan that have worked on various components of these projects. So um, that said, I am happy to take any questions if we still have time. And thank you so much again for your attention and for the invitation. We've got lots of time for questions. Um, just to let folks know our break and start of session one is shifted by 15 minutes. So we've got a full 15 minutes. Looks like Evan popped one up in the chat. Okay, let me stop my share. Um, so I'll we'll kind of alternate. Maybe we'll take one from the chat and then because there's a few hands raised as well. Does that work okay, Katie? I can manage things or if you just want to call oh, great. folks. Yeah, no, you, you can go ahead and, um, yeah, I was trying to find my chat. I have too many windows open, so go ahead. Thank you. No, no worries. So Evan's question, Evan Bear, were the unisexuals used in the treadmill experiment all of the same ploidy? Um, that is a great question. I would have to double check <laughs> the paper. I think they were all triploids, um, or at least the bulk, the ones that were included in the statistical analysis would have all been triploids. Um, at that site, that's a really neat site. It's just north of Columbus, Ohio. Um, and it's a place where they we actually have Texanum and Jefferson's and unisexuals that have both of those um, contributions. So we've done some other projects there where we had you know, LTTs in ponds with Jefferson's and LJJs in ponds with Texanum. And so there's a lot of variation at that particular location. But I think that Rob restricted it to one biotype for those tests. Yeah. And I've got Julie Leah. Go ahead, Julie. Hi, fantastic talk. That was really fun to hear everything synthesized in one place. So really great stuff. Um, I have a question about sperm storage and whether there's any indication that they can store sperm. So that's kind of part one. And then with respect to your results that they often um, elevate the ploidy in your experimental tests, I'm just kind of wondering if it's there's a bit of a keeping up with the Joneses kind of effect going on there. So um, if you're in the pond, and these, these guys are in the pond, <laughs> you know. Yeah, absolutely. They, they, they yeah. <laughs> Those are awesome questions. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll tackle that one first, but yeah, our hypothesis with that, with that experiment was that, um, you know, what, what I really wanted to do to back up when we had all these drift fence ponds was I wanted to get unisexual immigrants, right? I wanted to get individuals that were moving in from another pond and see whether those individuals were more likely to include a genome, right? Because you can imagine in a system with local adaptation that coming in and then picking up a whole locally adapted genome and sticking it in your offspring would be like a really cool thing to be able to do. Um, but unfortunately, we never got any immigrants. So we had a big mark recapture going for four years at that site. And um, never once did we document immigration 
So they apparently are very, and we also had though, I mean, astronomically high numbers of unmarked animals coming in all the time. So at best we were getting like a 15% recapture rate. Um, so it, it was just logistically challenging for a lot of reasons, but yes, I absolutely like that. I, that's, that's been a pet hypothesis forever. And I'd love to be able to test it that if, if you do have, uh, a dispersing individual, you know, would they be more likely, uh, to, to do ploidy elevation? It totally makes sense to me, but we've never been able to test it. The converse is kind of true too, though. If you're not a very good, if you're not very good at gene flow, and we know gene flow has ad advantageous, like can spread yeah. advantageous alleles around, borrow the gene flow from a different species. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> true. Yeah, absolutely. So following up on that, I think, connected question, Trevor Scott, what issues did you encounter when you attempted to use capture mark recapture in the experiment you spoke about earlier? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was the big one. It's just the, um, I, so, there were either huge numbers of salamanders coming from un, un, you know, fenced ponds and or uh, they were losing their tags. So we were pit tagging them, we were anesthetizing them um, and implanting the, the very smallest <laughs> pit tags. A paper came out a couple years later showing, and it was in laterally, showing that they do actually eject the pit tags. So they will just like, bloop them out and it was a lot. It was like 40% of their animals just blooped out their pit tags. So that was, I think, the, a, a big methodological issue. Um, so we, yeah, we were just, we were always just uh, buried in unmarked animals. And um, so, you know, I've always thought like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we, cause we have genetic samples from all these animals, if we could see with the genetics whether some of those animals that came in untagged had actually already been tagged, right, before. But with the unisexuals, they all have the same multi-locus haplotypes, right? So yeah, we can't even do like individual level um, identification with the genetics with them. So, so yeah, so that was the big deal was just our really low recapture rate, like I said, at best about 15%. And then, and then I think they were just losing tags. So I think we we're losing a lot of throwing a lot of money into the woods. <laughs> like, I like the, the scientific term blooped. blooped <laughs> right? it's very yeah. technical. <laughs> yeah. uh, Nick Cairns has his hand up. Go ahead, Nick. Thank you for the talk. Uh, that was really good. Every time I hear about this system, I'm absolutely blown away by the complexity. Um, well yeah, it's, it's such a nut system, and especially to have it all presented in one story. I appreciated that. Um, I was hoping you might be able to speak a little bit to the mitochondrial diversity. Um, you, you suggested that they were mo sort of similar to the streamside salamanders, but is there is, is, is species cohesion amongst these unisexuals sort of mitochondrial, or is there a bunch of different mitotypes scattered around that sort of match the nuclear genotypes that you're seeing? Um, that is a great question. I don't have a lot of data on diversity of the mitochondrial haplotypes, you know, for at least the kind of limited part of the range I've worked in, there's very little variation. So, um, you know, certainly they're fairly substantially different from Barbari, but as far as being different from one another, that's a great question. Um, I think that whenever I have a question about anything, it turns out Jim Bogart studied it. 20 years ago already. So um, I know he does have some assessments of mitochondrial diversity across a number of Canadian populations. Um, and he looked at, he used that to look at whether any of the L's, the nuclear uh, laterality genomes were just, were just ancestral, right? So are they just all kind of carrying the same L around as they as they moved northward following uh, glacial retreat. And it turned out, no, wherever there are laterality, they're swapping in and out new, new L's, <laughs> new versions of the L. Um, so I know that paper does have a little bit of an assessment of mitochondrial diversity, but yeah, it's, they're, they're fairly, um, fairly similar across as far as the, the ones that I've looked at. Thank question, you very much. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Nick. Uh, question from Julia Riley in the chat. When the tetraploid salamanders reproduce, what ploidy do they produce? 
That's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there is, you know, there's a limit. You can't keep adding genomes forever. Um, the tetraploids, we have, just because they're fairly low frequency, we don't have a lot of data on, uh, for like those captive breeding experiments of tetraploids. There might only be a couple tetraploid animals that are, that are represented there, but they did, I mean, we did have pentaploid um, eggs being produced. So Again, those tend to have really low uh, survivorship, um, but they, do, you know, they do seem to still, at least again from our very limited sample size, um, they they try ploidy elevation, <laughs> um, or at least they did under our experimental conditions. Uh, you know, one thing that's a huge mystery in this complex is ploidy reduction, right? It must it must happen. So Jim has always thought that maybe if you had what I think he calls symmetrical tetraploids, so something like an LLJJ, that maybe they would undergo a more normal meiosis and make LJ eggs um, or oocytes. And so uh, that makes sense to me, but it's not, uh, it's not something we've ever actually been able to, to document. So, you know, it must, I mean, yeah, they can't keep adding them forever. And we do have diploids pop up and we have populations that are primarily triploid. And so the question of how they're losing uh, genomes is, is still still an open one. And Thomas Hossey has his hand up. Go ahead, Thomas. Well, hi, thanks for the excellent talk. Of course, it's one of my favorite systems as well. Um, one thing that stuck out from your talk for me uh, is your indication that the blue spotted salamanders are in decline in your area. And that's something that resonates with me because we're seeing pretty similar severe uh, population reductions uh, in blue spotted salamanders on Peely Island. Um, mm. Very, very low numbers compared to contemporary or contemporary in contemporary samples compared to historical samples. And I'm just wondering if there's any indication that um, those declines in your area are restricted to blue spotted salamanders, or if you're seeing similar declines in other sexual ambisima that are part of the complex. Um, and if you have a sense of whether the um, laterality declines that you're seeing are restricted to where you are specifically or more general across the southern extent of the range in the US. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, the two, so. The ones that we we hear the most about here in, in Michigan and when I was down in Ohio, our, our laterality, right? Again, we're right at the, the edge of the range. Um, they barely make it into Ohio. And actually, so a lot of the work I did in Ohio was funded by the Division of Wildlife there um, with a goal of seeing whether there even were any full laterality populations left. Um, I always would chat with those folks though and say these unisexuals, you know, they, they raise a really interesting conservation conundrum too, right? Because if you want to protect laterally, and then you have LLLJ unisexuals, well, that's more laterally than a laterally. So <laughs> you're protecting them too. But the question of how you protect a non-species is a, a tricky one. Um, so, so that is one. And then Texanum actually, you know, uh, Texanum barely, it's kind of the converse, it barely ekes into Southern Michigan. Um, as far as its global status, it's just fine. But I do think, uh, you know, that those, those populations that we have up here of Texanum have been, um, have been in decline. And that is probably more of a habitat loss issue. You know, the ones, the spots I'm aware of that we can find them are now like subdivisions. So um, that there's probably a pretty, <laughs> pretty clear linkage there. So as far as the others, you know, I haven't heard about any concern. We, ha we have pretty robust tiger salamander populations. Um, we haven't seen a lot of change, at least in the time I've been at the George Reserve, in terms of the numbers of tigers that we see coming into the to the ponds to breed. Um, so, so yeah, I think you know, as far as kind of declines that aren't directly linked to habitat loss, it's really primarily laterally um, in this part of the range. And we'll take one final question from Matt Keeble in the chat. Um, and then, then we will take a break um, just to give space, but if Katie's willing, she might stick around and she can uh, chat with folks as well. Does mate, sorry, does male mate choice matter or can unisexual females find spermatophores even without successful courtship? That is an awesome question. Um, I don't know is the answer. So, you know, 
the term kleptogenesis implies that they are stealing something, right? That is a limited resource sort of. And I've always wondered if that's maybe not the case and they are maybe like more like sperm scavengers um, because as you know, probably most folks know, the males of these sexual species, it varies by species, but they'll produce a bunch of spermatophores during one courtship event typically. And I've observed, you know, when we've got salamanders breeding in the ponds, what look like unisexuals now, do we know they are? No, we got to genotype them. Um, but kind of hanging around the margins when other when when breeding courtship and breeding is happening. And so I wonder if they're picking up some of those extra spermatophores that are produced during courtship events. Um, and in which case, you know, maybe it's not having any sort of negative impact on the sexual tax. I've actually got a colleague here who watched. Uh, maculatum breeding event with a bunch of unisexuals kind of loitering around and then like darting in and out of the area of breeding maculatum. And so he was wondering, are they going in there and picking up the maculatum spermatophores? Um, so yeah, it's a great question. Um, I suspect that it would probably depend on the population composition, right? If you've got a bunch of males around, then they can probably just kind of use those extra spermatophores um, without too much of an impact. Now, when you get to the point where you've got 90, 95% of the population is unisexuals, um, then it might be a little bit harder for them to access those.